Thanks, Helen. So um, coaching cricket is probably one of the most fun and rewarding things I've ever done and continue to do with a bunch of young 15-year-old boys. Um, I've got about 15 of them, and they're the future of our country, and that's what we're talking about today. And I'm very pleased to say that, at least in my neck of the woods in on the northern beaches in Harbord, these young 15-year-old boys are... Well, that's uh, no other way to say it. They're not woke, this generation of 15-year-olds. So Gen Z, the Zoomers maybe, as we've heard, but I can tell you that out of the, you know, it's a small sample, but it's 15 boys and their parents, um, and we play all of the teams across, across the northern beaches. That's not the case, um, and that's very heartening. So I don't have any good news for you either. Um Michael's opened up and I thought, well, geez, how am I going to add to this? And particularly with the expert over here, Peter Jennings, former head of ASPE and worked in defence his whole life. What I'm going to talk about is the political side of the issues and the problems we have. We know it's certainly in this room, there's a number of us that understand these problems, but what are we going to do about it? And so I'm going to put it back on you because it's us that has to make the change. From a political perspective, we can understand what the issues are and we are in dire crisis. We talked about, Michael talked about societal readiness. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, so I'm not going to speak just about defence. And I'm also going to touch on something that Michael said is we need to alert the public. Well, how do we do that? That means leadership. So we might have had 14 defence ministers in the last whatever number of years, but we need leaders in our political parties that are able to get up there, effectively communicate the dire strait of our national security, which goes not just in defence, but as I'll talk about also across other parts of our economy. For instance, if you don't manufacture anything, you don't make anything here anymore, then that is a massive national security risk. Yes. Yes. So if you were to ask the average Aussie, is the world safer or more dangerous? Well, they'd probably say, oh, this may be a bit more dangerous. You know, we've got wars in the Middle East and, you know, Ukraine, but, you know, yeah. Um, is Australia prepared and do we need to be prepared? Well, the average Aussie would go, oh, look, I've, I've heard that they're spending all this money on defence, you know. So I think we're all right, and I go to Anzac Day every year. Um, but we know that's not the case. We had two of our Australian Navy divers attacked not long ago in international waters by Chinese Navy. They were hospitalised. Prime Minister Albanese covered it up on purpose. We know that because he was meeting with Xi Jinping a couple of days later at APEC in San Francisco. It then came out after that. That weakness has led to an attack of flares that happened just, what, two days ago now, perhaps less than two days, um, of a Chinese jet um, putting flares right in front of an Australian Sea Hawk helicopter flying in international waters as part of a UN mission enforcing UN sanctions um, around North Korea. Yeah. So I think... Foreign Minister Wong will send a strongly worded letter. <laughs> so, what's the future? What's the future for, for our kids and our grandkids? The trajectory that we're on, and I'm going to talk about the recruitment and retention crisis as well, and perhaps a way to, to tackle it. Um, but it doesn't seem we have the leadership. Well, we don't have the leadership. We don't have any public figures that have the guts to go out and tell the truth and talk to the public and say exactly what Michael and I'm sure Peter will tell you tonight. Here is the state of our national security. Here is how vulnerable we are. Here are the risks. Here in defence, in intelligence, in manufacturing, in all parts of the economy, 
And that's where we sit. No one does that. They sugarcoat it and they talk about NDIS or you know, the voice or whatever. So let's broaden the perspective beyond the military capabilities and let's look about look at things like energy security, manufacturing and effective leadership. So energy security. If you don't have energy security, you don't have national security. At the moment, we are dependent on China for over 90% of our solar panels and wind turbines that are imported into Australia. That poses a significant risk to our energy security. And we were told last year by the Australian security agencies that there's a quiet security flaw in all of the inverters that are on solar panels across solar farms and even on your rooftop. You need an inverter to take the energy from the sun through the panel and then back into the, into the wires and the grid. Those inverters are connected to the internet. Those inverters are Chinese. But no matter, let's not worry about that. Um, we also had we had a case at the WTO over over Chinese dumping wind turbines. It's not the only thing they dump on world markets, but they are currently dumping wind turbines. But we've dropped that, so we'll have a lot more cheap Chinese wind turbines. When we will cut down acres of trees, we will sink cement in. And I just got back from a trip to Dubbo via Wellington. Um, and I don't know if you ever want to go out there, um, but the Wellington solar farm is massive, covering agricultural land. And I can tell you from speaking to them, the farmers hate it. And we saw what happened in Texas. You have a hailstorm, and I said, you get hail out here? And they said, oh, yeah, we get hail out here. Yeah. Good. You saw what happened in Texas. 5,000-acre solar farm got hit with hail, ruined every solar panel with heavy metals then leaching into the ground. So this leads me into manufacturing decline. Manufacturing in Australia peaked in the 1960s, contributing 25% of the country's GDP, employing a significant portion of the workforce on well-paid jobs. Current reality, today manufacturing accounts for less or about 5% of value-added of our GDP. We offshored everything because it's cheaper. We don't make anything here anymore. We used to make cars. We used to, some of you remember a company called BHP Steel. 5%. That's not a recipe for long-term Australian sovereignty and is a national security risk because our economy relies on the inputs that we must import from foreign countries. Now, whether those foreign countries are China or the United States, it makes no difference because you're reliant on getting them here. And if someone stops that getting here because we can't keep the six lanes open, well, then your economy stops, which means you're open to coercion because the politicians know that, and so they give in, and you lose more sovereignty. But you've never had, but they've never had this discussion with you, or with the public. People say to me, "Oh, well, but hang on, we're a high-cost labour country. We we can't we can't manufacture." It's like really, what about Sweden? Country uh, less than half population of Australia. Very high cost labour rates. They do have cheap energy. They manufacture Volvo trucks, Volvo cars, Saabs, grip and jet fighters. White goods. We can do it too, we've done it before. Now you can either, if you want cheap energy, you, you basically got two choices. You can go the absolute cheapest option is coal. And we've got a lot of it, which is where we make our money because we export. Now, if you're into net zero, that's fine. Then you only have one other option, and that is nuclear. It's the only other option if you want net zero and you want affordable power. That's it. Coal or nuclear. We also have a lot of uranium, which we export. And we need to 
overturn that legislation to at least give us the option, give the Australian people the right to make up, make that choice and give companies like Rolls-Royce and Westinghouse and others the right to come down. So I've spoken with them as part of my job. We're not even going to touch you because you've got legislation that bans it. Why would we even bother? They're not going to analyse the market and provide a business case until that legislation is overturned. So why wouldn't we just overturn it? It's not saying we're going to get it. Just overturn it and it gives you the option to do that. And we can have Rolls-Royce and Westinghouse and others come in and provide a business case and say, right, here you go, public. Here are the advantages. Here's how much it will cost versus windmills and solar farms. <clears throat> What's the definition of leadership? Well, not what we have now. It's holding a position of, it's not holding a position of authority. It's not just about that. It's about inspiring and guiding others towards a common vision. We don't seem to have that either, but with all of the facts. It involves making tough decisions without putting them through endless committees and taking calculated risks, something particularly in the public service and the Department of Defence they shy away from. And then mobilising resources to achieve tangible outcomes. And not governing and making laws and decisions based on opinion polls. Do what's right and stand up for it. You know you're going to take flack, but do it anyway. <laughs> I do want to get now to, um, we talked about recruitment and retention, and it's a massive issue. We, we heard from Professor, Professor Evans about that. Um, for the last few years, um, as part of my role in the Liberal Party, um, this policy branch. I've been speaking with a professor at ANU, um, Professor John Blackson, who's now in DC for ANU, but um, he, he formulated an idea, and we've been working on it for, for a number of years, called OSMAX, and it's brilliant. It stands for Australian um, National and Community Service Scheme, but it's voluntary. Now, there are some countries that have a version of this scheme, and it's very good politically, because it's voluntary, we believe that you could sell it here. There are some um, Scandinavian countries that run it. So essentially, you're saying to young, young people, give me a year or two years or whatever you decide, and you can either do one or two years in um, Army, Navy, or Air Force, but if you don't, you don't want to go the military route, that's fine. You go into the SES, the AMBOs, the fireys, um, bushfire service. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. You go into um, a community group, um, Salvos, for instance, Smith Family, whatever it is to give back and engage with your community. Now, again, it's voluntary. You don't have to do it, but if you do, we'll give you a, a nice certificate after it, we might help you in your uni debt or TAFE or whatever it is, right? Um, we found that in the countries that do that, they're actually oversubscribed. Mm -hmm. So they've got more young people wanting to do these schemes than they had budgeted for or thought that they'd get. And why is that? Well, the number one reason is because it turns out every employer in that country, when he sees two resumes, one with a bloke that, or a person that's, that's done the scheme and volunteered for it, and one that hasn't, guess who gets the job? Because it turns out good kids. And it brings back, and again, the professor was talking about this, we don't learn these things anymore. And that sort of brings back an idea for our youth at a young age, instead of being on their devices, and not on their computers, and not playing sport anymore, and not joining the cadets, to actually understand the concept of giving back and engaging with your community and doing something and being a giver and, and instead of just a taker all the time. And they feel proud about it, and the kids enjoy it. And the feedback from those schemes overseas is overwhelmingly positive, but we won't even talk about it here. Why not? 
So, it's up to you, it's up to us. It's up to us to demand that leadership. When you go and vote, when you talk to your friends and your family, who would, no one else is going to do it. And otherwise we're going to just continue to watch the slide of a great nation. So I'm putting it back into your court. We've all got agency. We can all talk to our friends and our family and be engaged and our kids. And you can make a difference because you're not alone. You'd be surprised. There are a lot of people out there who are receptive to this because they're seeing their country not being the same as it used to be or it was or it could be. Thank you.